Well, good morning and welcome to Southbridge. Thank you so much for joining us today. And if it's your first time joining us in person or even online, I just want to say welcome. And if it is your first time here in person, I just want to invite you to stop outside of our first time guest at our first time guest tent where we would love to be able to just give you a gift for being here today and just saying thank you for showing up and would like to make a connection with you. Happy Father's Day to our dads out there. Great job, dads, leading today. You could be doing a lot of other things today, whether it's playing golf, sleeping in, or watching the golf tournament, but you chose to be here. So great job of, of leading your family today. And if you didn't smell or see on the way in, there's a what they're calling a meatapalooza. So there's all kinds of good stuff, bacon, sausages, all the kinds of good stuff that you can get out there, and I think they're serving them in a meat boat. I don't know where that term came from, but it's just a vessel for you to carry your different meat. So guys, make sure you go get one of those after service if you haven't done so already. Mother's Day, you guys get coffee. Father's Day, we get hardened arteries. I don't know who's winning more. Like, so guys, thank you again so much for being here today. I wanna invite you to go ahead and stand up, and we're gonna begin in our time of worship. so glad you guys decided to be here today. We're here to celebrate the God um, who's not limited by our imaginations of what can and can't be done. We worship the God of the impossible. Oh, just one word, you calm the storm that surrounds me. Just one word, the darkness has to retreat. Oh, just one touch, I feel the presence of heaven. Oh, just one touch, my eyes are open to see, my heart can't help but believe. There's nothing that our God can't do, there's not a mountain that He can't move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. takes faith. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power let faith arise and let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. 
Jesus. So I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. And let faith arise. And let all agree. There's no power like His power. There's nothing that our God can do. There's not a mountain that Praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can do. No, there's nothing that our God can do. There's not a prison wall we can break through. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can do. nothing that he can't do but there's one thing that he always does he's always faithful to his promises so if you're leaning on that this morning let's lean into the words of this song God is faithful to his promises Put our faith in Him this morning. Oh, I put 
pray that that would be true for us today. That for some of us today, that would be a declaration, a commitment that for all of our life, for all of our days, Lord, we would sing of your goodness. We would declare your goodness and your faithfulness with our lives, to our friends, to our families, to those around us. I pray that these would not just be words to a song, but they would be words that we live by. I pray that they would sink deep roots, that they would transform us from the inside out, Lord. And now we pray for Pastor Scott as he's preparing to bring the word. I pray that as we open these scriptures together, Lord, that you would open our minds to them. God, that you would illuminate these scriptures to us so that we would see and understand, Lord, that we would hear and understand. We're trusting that your word's not gonna return void today. We're leaning on that promise that your word never returns void, but it always accomplishes its purpose. And so would you accomplish your purpose in us today? We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said together, amen. You guys can go ahead and grab a seat. Happy Father's Day. Thank you so much. Even got my name said back to me. That's awesome. Glad you guys are here today. And uh, happy Father's Day. We are glad that you're here. Dads, thank you for being with us. There's lots of things you could do to choose to come here and worship Jesus and bring your family here. Uh, we don't want to miss that. So I want to give you a hand. So thank you, dads. We're glad you're here. Thank our dads. We've got a, a blessing for you. Several of our men have been barbecuing. So there are meats out there. I've heard several people say, we got the meats this, this morning. Um, that's gel meat. If you look up Arby's, we got real meats here today. And so uh, that is a gift for you. Some of the dads uh, in the Mother's Day, I don't know how long ago, that was about a month ago. Uh, some of the dads came up to me like, well, you're spoiling these moms. You, usually the churches just give them a flower. You got a coffee truck out there. What are you going to do for us? And so on your way out, the youth group will have chrysanthemums. Just kidding. It's a barbecue sandwich for you guys out there. Uh, so feel free to grab that. Uh, but let me just say this on behalf of dads, and this might not be universally true, but for most dads, uh, people will joke and be like, yeah, just give him some barbecue, let him watch whatever he wants on TV today, we'll be good. Uh, really, your dad wants respect and grace. Uh, respect from you and then uh, grace that at least he's trying. And so why don't we give him that as a gift today? I've got a gift for you, dads. Um, I've got a shorter message for you, so don't amen, don't amen, don't amen. <laughs> um, but I'm not going to beat you up. Today's not beat up the dad's day. In fact, I want to encourage you um, and encourage you to keep trying. And I've done before, where at the end of a message, I've said, I want to have all the dads come up here. We're going to have a special prayer form. I want to do that at the beginning today. And our church will get to see who I'm talking to when I talk to our dads. And if you're at home, we love you. Hope you come to the second service in person. Um, but... Dads, would you come on up here? I'm going to pray for you as we get started. On John, you're in the front row. Wait, sit right there. You can just stand up, and we'll start praying for you. I like your pants, by the way, too. Jack, come on up here. Why don't you guys come on up here? And church, one of our customs, like when we send missionaries, do things like that, we put our hands out like we're laying hands on them. The scripture talks about setting people apart or anointing them for special service, special things. Uh, being a father is a unique role in our world. I mean, what other role do you know of that actually shares and shapes a title with God and how people will then view God later in life, good or bad. Father's oftentimes referred to when we talk about dear, our Father who art in heaven. I mean, we get to call him Abba, Father. And people, good dads, bad dads, the first image they get are these men. And so church, we want to pray for them. And so if you are uh, 
a student or a child of one of these men or a wife or an aunt or whoever you are in the congregation, a young man in our church uh, who hasn't had children yet, we just put your hands out and uh, we're going to pray for these guys. Father, our Heavenly Father, we come before you today. We set these men apart for a special task. Uh, you've given them responsibilities in Scripture. You haven't given anyone else. You've given them titles. You haven't given anyone else. You've given them influence. So you haven't given anyone else. And that's not something to pop our chest out with. That is humbling and scary. And so we need you. I pray that every one of these men would abide in you. That means remain in you, be connected to you. If they don't know you as Savior yet, that they would come to know you today. And I pray that they wouldn't, because of their failures or their mistakes, stop trying. God, I pray that you would encourage them with your word, with your truth, and that you'd empower them with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Our right, dad, thank you so much. You can hang out here if you want to. Um, it's not going to be that short of a message. Uh, my goal is a 35-minute message today, and there's a timer up here, uh, so none of you need to tell me when we hit that spot. <laughs> and I'll tell you when we start. It's in about five minutes. Um, now, we're going to be in Mark chapter 9 in the Bible today. We're doing our series, Sent. Um, God sends us into this world as his witnesses, Acts 1.8. We're to make disciples. That's the end of every gospel and different phrasing, different wording. And so we're talking about what does it mean to be sent? And so we talked last week, we had uh, Peter Rochelle here, and he was talking about being an ambassador for Christ. A couple weeks ago, I laid the foundation for this series and talked about that we're, we're all uniquely made. We've got a universal and a unique calling on our lives from Ephesians 2.10. And today we're going to talk about this being sent out as fathers, We've got a unique responsibility to disciple our children. The scriptures actually say in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4, fathers, do not exasperate, doesn't say parents, doesn't say church, exasperate your children. Do not frustrate them by not training them in the Lord. That's what the meaning of that passage is. And so you've got a unique call. Moms don't have, the church doesn't have, youth pastors don't have, like it's you. You are the primary disciple maker of your home. That's a heavy responsibility. And so I want to encourage you today. It's a scary thing. We're going to talk about being fearless fathers, and how do we do that? Mark chapter 9 is our passage. As you think about dads, you know, I mentioned the titles that we have, responsibilities that we have, but dads kind of are in a category of their own, whether you're a follower of Christ or not yet a follower of Christ. I mean, in the fitness world, we've got our own genre of bodies, the dad bod, right? I don't know if it's a compliment or not. In the entertainment world, we've got dad jokes. How about that, right? Does your dad got dad jokes? Anybody here? They do not appreciate how funny you are, do they? All the things you could say, right. It's like, you know, dad's reading a book. What are you reading, dad? It's an anti-gravity book. It's impossible to put it down. You know, they just say this stuff, and you're like, do you, is there a book on these? Like, where'd you come up with that? You know, all these different things that dad says, and and there's dad, so there's dad bods, there's dad jokes, there's dad jobs, right? There's unique things, and they're usually dangerous things. And the kids are really small. So I think there might be a monster under my bed. Now, dads go check because you know there's not a monster there. But what if there was? Like, what are you going to do? And then if your kid's honest, because kids can be really humorously honest, they'd probably say, it's not that I think you're going to beat the monster, you're just bigger than the rest of us, so it'll take longer to eat you, we can get away. There's a noise outside, you know. No husband's going, mom, mom, go get that. Like, they expect you to do it, Dad. I'm, where's the equal rights for women? The equal, I'm just sticking up for you, honey. Why don't you go check and see if that's an axe murderer? Like, that's a dad job. Dad's jobs are dangerous. Dad's, you can't, some of you can't cook at all, all right? Like, you can't even find stuff in the pantry. You go stand in the pantry, and you look, and you're like, I eat the cereal every day. Where, honey, where are the Cheerios? Walks in front of you, grabs this right here. It's at the eye level. It's right there. You can't find it. But when it's time to have people over and we're going to grill outside with an open flame, right? Dad's got it. That doesn't even make sense. <laughs> but it's dangerous. So it's a dad job. And dads do these scary, they teach teenagers how to drive. Like there's just stuff you do as dads. There's some places you get to go because of that too, right? Maybe it's the basement, maybe it's the garage, maybe it's the attic. With the dad jobs, not only do you get to buy some tools, but you have some dad's spaces, and everybody thinks you're working on a project. Some of us are just going, I just need some space. Y'all are crazy. So the other day at my house, uh, we were having my daughter's 16th birthday party. And, uh, under our deck, it's, kind of, it's a covered deck in the sense that there's lattice around the bottom of it, and it's high enough that you can stand up underneath it. And it's a space that, it's a dad space. 
It's dark. It's dirt. It's kind of the junk drawer of our backyard. You know the junk drawer when you're having people over? It's like, clean the counter. Okay, put it in that drawer. I was looking at ours the other day in the kitchen. We have a digital camera in there. <laughs> I'm holding my phone going, Why, when did we have that? I'm going to be black and white pictures. I don't even know. They're like our great-great-grandparents. Why do we have this? We just throw stuff in there. So underneath the deck is like the junk drawer of our backyard. There's guests are coming over, clean up the back, throw it underneath the deck. Like there's stuff under there. It's kind of a mess. I'm usually the only one that goes under there. It's dark. It's dirty. And our yard's fenced in as well. And so I don't expect to find any other living things in there. (laughs) I go under there the other day, about two weeks ago, and I needed some me time. No, I needed uh, to do a project. And so I was going under there. Expecting to be alone. I heard some movement. <laughs> I didn't say, hey, Shana, there's something under here. No, I was like, maybe it's a squirrel. Maybe it's something. I don't know. So I go toward the sound. And so I, I go over to the spot. There's this big piece of plastic. And what leaped out of that spot was not the size of a squirrel. Okay? It jumps out. It jumps one direction. I jump the other direction. I'm screaming. I'm jumping in one corner, but there's lattice. It's jumping in the other corner against the house. And then I look and realize it's a deer. How did deer get underneath my deck? And so then I go out in the yard. A couple of kids are out there. Our youngest daughter, she's 11. I say, all the personalities start to come out. I say, there's a deer under the deck. She says, can we keep it? I was like, no, we can't keep it. I said, here, we got a plan. We're going to get out of there. I said, Janie, she's 13. I said, Janie, go open all the gates. We got three gates on our fence. I said, open the gates. I'll go and scare it out, and then we'll shoo it toward one of the gates. So she goes and opens the gates. Like, she's helping me out. She's active. She's into this thing. I go under the deck. My plan is there's one opening in the lattice. I'm going to get behind it, shoo it out. I go under there. It freaks out, runs through a piece of the lattice. All right, now it's on the yard. I'm going, I, and, I, and then I said, grab your phone, because some of you think I make this stuff up. I was like, grab your phones. Nobody grabs their phone. But then Janie goes, I got it, and starts running at the deer. I said, no, 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 don't do that. <laughs> I didn't know. I don't know much about deer. I don't know where it's family, a pack. What do you call a herd, like a bunch of deer? I don't even know what these things are called together. I don't know why it's underneath my deck, how it got in the fence, how long it's been in there. Like, I don't know any of this stuff. And so when she says she's going to go get it, I'm thinking, well, if you touch it, maybe the mom, it'll die. It's like a bird. I don't even know if that's true, but like, don't touch it. So we're trying to shoo it. It starts panicking. It did what I would do. I'm just trying to get away from these crazy people. That's what I was doing under the deck. And so then it busts its way through our fence. It's too small to jump over it. And so it pushes its way through these, this, we got these, you know, pillars on our, they're like five inches wide or whatever there. And it busts its way through. Shanna comes home. She goes, what happened to our fence? I'm like, you wouldn't believe it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> so, it happened. You can ask my youngest two kids. Because it's going to a dad spot to do a dad job. And there's dangerous stuff. And dads, we love that. Some of you have served in the military. Some of you are police officers. Some of you negotiate big deals. You take lots of risk. There's a lot of dads, though, that run from the God-given responsibility of being a dad. We'll do a lot of other dangerous stuff, but when you start to see the weight of what it is to be a father in Scripture, it's why you see some of the heroes of our faith do awesome on the military field, leading a nation, but failing in the home, David, was his own son, Absalom, that was going to overthrow his kingdom because he failed to discipline in the home and was passive as a father and it created disruption amongst all the kids and weakness in his kingdom. Hmm. How about Adam? Adam's naming all the animals. You got portipus and tortoise and rhinoceros and hippopotamus. Adam was a rapper. So he's naming them all. Going through the thing. Walrus. Oh, that's a friendly one. Then warthog. Warthog is an evidence, I think, that Adam and God had a fun relationship before the fall. Like, you know you're getting along with somebody when you can tease them, right? Like, Adam had to be like, walrus, porpoise, tor- God, watch this, warthog, two bad things. We put them together. <laughs> That's the name of this thing. And they probably laugh together. So he's killing it at work. He's passive in leading his family. And all of us have paid ever since. His kids, one of them kills the other one. Then lead his wife. Sin enters the world. It's a big deal. It's scary. But I'm not here to beat you up today, dads. I want to encourage you. We all fail. None of us have a perfect faith. But keep going. 
that's what the guy in this passage does. Mark chapter 9, uh, what's happened context-wise is that uh, Jesus has been teaching his disciples. He started to tell them directly, or we'd say drop hints because they just don't even have a category for this, that he's going to be killed. And that three days later, he'll rise from the dead. They don't get it. He grabs three of his closest disciples, friends, takes them up on top of a mountain, and it's what we oftentimes refer to as the transfiguration. And so they have this mountaintop experience. Some of you have had that before, maybe in a, a prayer time, or you've gone to a conference, or uh, you read a book, or you're just growing close. You're just in a season where it's like you can hear God, and you're growing close to him. And then you come down from the mountain, and the troubles of life are still happening. <laughs> Last week, it wasn't here. The reason why Peter Rochelle, another pastor in our town that we love, church that we would send people to, was here preaching. Because I was leading a group of about 50-some people from our church, about 55 people, I think it was, that we were going to all these sites in the Holy Land. We were going to spots where Jesus had significant moments on his way to the cross, the empty tomb, the Garden of Gethsemane, on the Sea of Galilee. And so people were just immersed in the Bible and connecting with Jesus And what happened to all of us as we came back? I don't even know what day it is sometimes. (laughs) But the troubles that were happening when I left, they're still here. The difficulty in every area of life, whether it's physical, relational, spiritual, financial, it didn't pause because you were on the mountaintop. That's what's happening here in this passage of Scripture. Is that Jesus is transfigured. His glory has shown in their presence. Then he says to them, "Uh, don't talk about this until after I rise from the dead. What? Then on their way down, they see that there's a big crowd gathered, but they're fighting with each other. And look at what happens. The key characters in this story, when you know the context, are not the son, it's not the scribes. It's this father and the disciples. And the theme, it's a battle of faith. Look at that. Mark chapter 9, verse 14. And when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and the scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, talking about Jesus, were greatly amazed and ran to him and greeted him. And he asked them, what are you arguing with them? What are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, unnamed, teacher, I brought my son to you For he has a spirit that makes him mute, so he can't talk. Whenever it seizes him, when it decides to take control of him, it throws him down, and then what word reads something a lot like um, a seizure. He foams at the mouth, grinds his teeth, he becomes rigid, so I asked your disciples to cast it out. That makes sense because if you're reading the full context, back in Mark chapter 6, Jesus sent them out, and they healed a bunch of people and cast out demons. They've already had success doing this. Mark 6, 12 to 13, if you want to read that on your own. Teacher, I brought my son to you, so he came for Jesus because of his condition, and he talks about the condition, I showed up, you weren't here. So I asked your disciples, the guys that are always with you, who've had past success, to cast it out, and this is a key phrase, they were not able Um, some people say that this could have been translated, they weren't strong enough. Mm. They lacked potency, ability. And he answered them, oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to endure you, to bear with you? Bring them to me. Let's pause right there, because I'm only preaching for 35 minutes, so let's not read the whole thing yet. Imagine the scenario. Imagine you're the father. You bring your son, you're looking for Jesus, Jesus isn't there. Some people have that experience at church, by the way. Imagine if you go to church and you never encounter Jesus, you only encounter church people. Hmm. It's discouraging. I I warn my own kids, uh, some of the meanest people you'll ever meet are at church. It doesn't mean they're a Christian. Everybody who's around Jesus is not being changed by Jesus. And so they come. Who knows what else he's tried? We don't know. The dad's not even named. So we can't know some of the details. Anything I would say that he went to other doctors, that he's gone to the temple, like it's speculation. It doesn't say. It's just this guy shows up. He's looking for Jesus. I came for you. He was gone, transfiguring, revealing his glory, the fun for you guys up on the mountaintop. But your disciples were here. and They've done it before. And so they couldn't. They lacked strength. And now everyone's not even paying attention to us. They're arguing with each other. Hmm. 
I wonder what that felt like. Hey, does anyone see my son? We're later going to see that he's been thrown into the fire. He's got burn marks. He can't speak. He convulses. It's everything the father can do just to keep this kid alive. And now he's watching the scribes, religious leaders, sometimes referred to as lawyers, but not the lawyers we think about uh, in trial. There's people who defend the law of the Bible. And the disciples, so Jesus' closest guys, and they're arguing with each other. That's not the battle that needs to be taking place. There is a battle. That's not it. And dads, when you became a father, you entered into a battle, whether you wanted to or not. Some of you have a natural inclination to fight. Some of you have a natural inclination for flight. Psychologists talk about that. I don't know what the percentages are. But whether you want to run and be passive from the weight of the responsibility you have as a father or whether you want to confront the enemy, you're in a fight. It's like when you fasten that first diaper, you're taping those gloves up and there's a target on you and the enemy's coming for you and he will go after your kids. Ask Job. Ask David. Ask Abraham. Your kids are under attack. We're engaged in a battle, and it's scary. So what do you do? I'm going to give you just uh, three truths, but if at 35 minutes I'm still on the first one, that's all you're going to get today, because I'm stopping. No amens. All right. I like that. <laughs> three truths of helping you become a fear. We're all in process. To become a fearless father. The first one is this. You need to know your real enemy. You are in a battle. And we must be aware, be alert, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. Be aware of your real enemy. This passage is actually about a battle of faith. In the larger context, it's Jesus trying to equip and teach the next generation, his disciples, his spiritual children, how to carry on the faith. Because there's eternal consequences here. And they're the ones who fail in the passage. The father, inadequate faith. One of the reasons why many people turn to this passage is because he says, I believe, help my unbelief. And we've all been there. Not perfect. He doesn't call Jesus Lord. He doesn't call him master. He doesn't say you're the savior, the son of God, the one who's going to rise after three days. He doesn't know all that. He's a teacher. He's not. But he's moving forward. He's getting a kid to Jesus. He's asking, I can't. He recognizes it's a spirit. It's not a failure of the education system. It's not an issue of the medical. I went to the hospital. They couldn't do anything, so figured I'd try it. That's not that. There's darkness in this kid that only you can fix. So I came for you, and you weren't here. But I didn't stop. So I asked your disciples. He's fighting. Imperfectly, but he's fighting. And he is the one, other than Jesus, in the passage that actually knows the real enemy. We need to know our real enemy or we're in a lot of trouble. How many of you uh, dads, do you remember the game Mike Tyson's Punch-Out? It's like a classic video game. Remember that? About how many? So I know how much of this I need to tell you. John Cullen, don't raise your hand slowly. I see you. I know you played that game. We went to high school together. Mike Tyson's Punch-Out, awesome game uh, at that time. Now it looks like, you know, what, you played this? These don't look like real people. But then it was like, this is amazing. I remember I had a friend who had a Nintendo. I didn't have one. And he was out of town. So I went to his house, volunteered to let the dog out, uh, so I could play Nintendo for like 12 hours straight and played this. And you fight through all these different fighters, and the goal is to try and get to Mike Tyson. You remember? It like starts with Glass Joe. Then you got a guy named King Hippo. You could never name someone that today. But then they did King Hippo, Don Flamenco, Super Macho Man, Piston Honda. Remember him? Anybody with me on this? Okay. All right. Somebody, Matt, I got you, Keith. I like a bunch of the elders. We don't play. That's like it's qualification now. I play Mike Tyson. There you go. But what happened was, each of those, and like Glass Joe, they called him that because he's the easiest one. He kind of telegraphs his moves, and he's got a terrible defense. And so if you just dodge or block, and then just start hitting him in the body, body blows, body. if you hit him in the head, then he starts fighting again. But if you just keep hitting him in the body, boom, 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 it's over. It's easy to figure that guy out. And they get progressively harder. Uh, I think that uh, Piston Honda was like the fourth guy. He was one of like the big uppercuts. I didn't play it in research for that. I should have done that. Maybe I'll do that today for Father's Day. <laughs> And what happens with him is he's faster and he's better at the attack, but he's still not that good at defense. And so if you can dodge one of his uppercuts, then you start hitting him in the body, then you use the star punch, boom, he's done. 
So each one has a different strategy. The hardest is Mike Tyson himself because he's aggressive and fast and agile, he dodges. Can you imagine, imagine you had a fight in real life and you spent all of your preparation time, you know, like Rocky, you went to Russia and you were lifting stuff in a barn or whatever and you thought you were fighting, maybe not Glass Joe, perhaps Piston Honda. And then when they go to introduce the fighters, you've prepared for Piston Honda. His uppercut, poor counter defense, his reach, his size, you're just a little thing on the screen, but you got him. In this corner, it's your name. And in this corner, Iron Mike Tyson. What? Nope. Mike Tyson's 55 years old today. I would not fight him. Much less when he was 25. But if I had prepared to fight Glass Joe, and I was like, I got this. This is awesome. And then all of a sudden, what? See, some of us in our spiritual battles for our kids... We got the wrong enemy. There are real enemies out there other than Satan himself. There is evil that's coming after your kids. But lost people aren't actually your enemy. They just need to be rescued. There's a controlling force behind all of that. And if you just prepare, if you think the real problem is the education system, then you, you'll think the solution is reforming that. If you think the real problem is who's in office and getting the right laws, you're going to think the next election is the answer to fixing our culture. See, we can do a lot of stuff. I read an article that we actually think that we can create humans now. We still can't change their hearts to turn them toward God. That's the real battle. And the enemy's coming after your heart and your children's hearts and he'll use all, the, all that other stuff as symptoms. It's obvious that it's darkness. Most of it's pretty obvious that it's darkness. I'm not here to condemn all that. I hope you know, standing against that, that's a good thing. But if you mistake and think that's the real enemy, you will lose, and it is deadly. And that's what's happening in this passage. These guys, the scribes step up when the disciples fail. <laughs> At least they're trying. I and mean, we can dog them out. But they could have been like gatekeepers. Uh, I'm here to see Jesus. Yep, what's the, what's the issue you got? My son, okay, okay. Um, we're going to just have to set an appointment. We got women running through crowds just to touch his robe. He's pretty busy. We'll get back to you. <laughs> Apparently they didn't pray based on verse 29, but at least they stepped in and tried something, but then they got distracted, which is oftentimes what happens. They couldn't, they were meeting failure and actually helping this kid, and so instead they turned to the scribes, which they've seen Jesus fight before. Now they probably just, I don't know this, the passage doesn't say this, but in Mark chapter 6, verses 12 and 13, they had success casting out demons. Now they're having failure, but they don't pray. I'm assuming whatever it was they did in Mark chapter 6, they're trying to do that again. Here's what you need to know. Your past failures do not define you. All dads need to process that for a second. And your current success does not refine you. But your failure will. See, God forms our faith in the midst of our failure. Your past failure does not define you. But your current success will not refine you either. And if all you have is success in parenting, congratulations, your baby is three. No, just kidding. (laughs) It probably means you're not doing it right. Because God requires us to risk for him, take steps of faith. And the only way you can always be successful is if you create your own little version of Christianity and your own little world and comforts actually your God. See, whatever controls you is actually your real God. And if it's the Christ of the Bible that we read about, the Jesus that we read about in the scriptures, the real God... Not some made-up version, not some American version, not a Republican or Democrat version, the real one that's in the Bible. If that is your, you have to take risks. And he will pull you out of your comfort zone. And you will fail. One of the interesting things about Scripture is like in this passage, in the midst of failure, Jesus has this tendency to show up. (laughs) 
Think about when Jesus first called the disciples. Luke chapter 5, hey, Peter, can I use your boat? We're going to use it as a pulpit and put it on the water. I'm going to preach for a little while. And then at the end of that, he looks at Peter and goes, hey, why don't we catch some fish? I tried that all night. Lord, yep, do it again. You're a teacher. I'm a fisherman. But okay. He met him in his failure. After Peter denies Jesus three times, he's out fishing again. Again, doesn't catch anything. A guy from the shore, he doesn't recognize. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> If they lied about it, like fishermen can tend to do, doing okay. I wonder if Jesus would have been like, all right, keep going. He says, we haven't caught a thing. Try the other side as if we haven't, we've been on it for a while, all right? We tried that, but they do it. And then they get to the shore and Jesus already has fish. <laughs> he doesn't need you, but he invites you and he will meet you in your failure and form you in the process. The battle is you have a real enemy and he's very dangerous. A roaring lion. We often quote that in 1 Peter in chapter 5 and verse 8, but listen to what it says in the next part, verses 9 and 10. 1 Peter chapter 5, be sober-minded, be watchful, be aware. That's the point I'm making today. Your adversary, the one, not, not the one who's speaking on your behalf, Jesus, but the one who's speaking lies against you, wants to get in your mind, tell you things that aren't true. He's the accuser, your adversary, your real enemy, opponent. The devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Okay, who? The people who aren't doing this, resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world and after you've suffered a little while. So it's not until after, sometimes we get mad, God's not there when we want. The God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you because you'll realize you need him. To him be dominion. That's why you're here to glorify him forever and ever amen but if you just create a little cocoon of your christian culture and live within that and everything's under your control (laughs) that's not christianity so you know you're running from the battle and you're to be engaged be aware of your enemy he's dangerous if not it's dead worse than mike tyson i was reading stories this week about people killed in the military in friendly fire you know what oftentimes happens in those scenarios it's not just, hey, somebody was too far behind me. They miss. It's like you get, it gets chaotic. There's lots of shooting. Do you remember the story of a guy named Pat Tillman in 2006? I think it was 2006, maybe 2004, somewhere in that range. Um, that was one of the stories that I read. I know it's a controversial one, by the way, because what happened is he's a, he was a professional football player for the Arizona Cardinals, for those of you who don't know. He's got a great story of, of always kind of fighting through difficulty. He got the last scholarship. The only reason he started playing football is because he got cut from the baseball team. They got the last scholarship to go to Arizona State, and he was the 226th pick in the draft. And then he goes into the military, and everyone's like, he's a hero. He got killed in combat. About a month later, the Department of Defense releases, uh, it was friendly fire, actually. And what the criminal investigation report says, now there's lots of articles you can find in the Washington Post. Everybody's got their own political spin. They try to put, digging up his journals and saying he was against the war. And then other people going, like, he was a hero. It's like, oh, uh, like life, it's confusing. Forgetting all that, in 2007, there's a report that came out and said what happened was he's riding in his Humvee with his guys. And because there was an attack from Afghan insurgents, they split up. Car trouble, lots of things went wrong, bad radio contact. They started fighting. And then in the midst of the gunfire and the chaos and the enemy, they accidentally started shooting at each other and he died and so did another guy. Hmm. It's dangerous. Failure's real. And we are losing. I'm not just making that up. It's not dramatic preacher talk. Statistically, we know that there are about 800,000 of kids in Christian homes that are walking away from the faith every year. Listen to these stats. In 2016, 39% of what, we're talking about just Gen Z right now, so people that are basically, I don't know, 10 to 25, 27 years old, somewhere in that range. In 2016, 39% of them were considered secularized. Secularized means no identification. Maybe they're agnostic or atheist, but they're not. Buddhist, Hindu, 
Catholic, Christian, like they don't believe in God. So 2021, most recent numbers that we have that I've been made aware of, it was about 44, almost in a half percent, 44.4% are now that. So it's growing fast. Author James White has a book called Meet Generation Z, Understanding and Reaching the New Post-Christian World. He says this, 19% of Americans would call themselves former Christians. Now the Bible tells us there's no such thing. First John, they leave, they're never part of you. Okay, so what's happening? Well, projections are bad. Uh, recent studies show that the current rate of these kids walking away from the faith, by the year 2050, it's not as far away as you think, 35 million youth raised in Christian homes will disaffiliate from Christianity. That's over a million a year, so it's gonna keep picking up, they're saying. The base prediction, is the best case scenario, is the unaffiliated population will go from 17 to 30%. That's significant, but, it could be way worse. And there are lots of projections about that. See, the battle that we're in is rescuing the, those of you that are saved fathers, those of you that are followers of Christ. God has done that miracle in your heart of moving you from without God and without hope to being in Christ. Changes your identity, changes who you are. And then your mission is to rescue not just your kids, but I hope that would be your first priority but everybody that's headed that direction. And so in order for that to happen, not only do you need to be aware of your real enemy, the one behind all the evil we see in this world, all the other fire, but you also need to be engaged and actively living out your faith. And if I told you, if I told you you're trying to lose weight, hey, I know a way you can do it 10 times faster. If I told you, make an investments, 10 times the return. If I told you, Whatever it is that you're trying to do, learn a language. There's this app. It makes it 10 times faster, easier, whatever. You do it. Listen, dads. Your faith and action is 10 times more powerful than any faith declarations you make. We're out of time. It's 35 minutes. There's a lot more that could be said. But the passage ends with the power of prayer. The disciples say, how come we couldn't do it? Why were we failing in the battle for this kid's life? This kind. So there's different kinds of demonic forces. There's different levels of darkness. This kind only comes out by prayer. We see prayer all through the Bible. And it's powerful. And it's part of activating your faith. So dads, if you don't have a broken heart for your kids and for other lost people, then we begin to pray for your own heart that it would be the heart of God because that's what God has. When Jesus looks out at Jerusalem, he weeps that his people, his own people, have rejected him. Who do you weep for? That's true for all of us, not just dads. I'm going to pray. We'll wrap up. You can always wonder what the rest of this message is going to be. Father, We come before you today, and I I pray for those men that were standing at the front of the stage. I pray that you would do an amazing work in our hearts to realize the battle that we're engaged in, that we will fail, but you will meet us in our failure. That you'll do a work beyond what we could ever ask or imagine in us, according to your power, which is the Holy Spirit, at work in us. I think about how panicked the disciples were when Jesus said that he was leaving, they didn't want him to leave. He said, no, I've got to send the helper. It's the Holy Spirit. It's going to come in and indwell you. And then when he gives them their commission, you'll be my witness. He says, hey, hold up. You can't do this on your own power. You wait until I send the Holy Spirit. Father, will you fill each man who stood up on the stage today with the Holy Spirit? Some of them don't even have the Holy Spirit, God. God, will you save them? Bring, make them alive. And while we'll fail in lots of ways, we'll fail in trying to teach the Bible, we'll fail in how we live it out, we'll fail in losing our temper, our patience, our self-control, our gentleness, our joy, our love, and all the fruits of the Spirit are areas where we will fail. Will you help us to realize that you meet us in the failure? That it's through our weaknesses that you're made known. It's actually in our inadequacy that you show up. I think about the dad. One of the things I would have said, and I'm not trying to preach this through the prayer, but it's once... Once the man acknowledges his own inadequacy, that's when we get to see God's ability. 
And so here we are, it's broken, not just men, fathers, people. We need you. Some of us are under demonic attack, and we see it through the lies we believe. We see it through the bondage that we live in. You came to set us free. Pray that everyone here would be free in Christ. Everyone who hears these words ever would know the freedom. You came to set the captives free. I pray that you'd set us free. I pray for our church to not run from dark places in our city, from dark spots in people's lives, that we wouldn't just say, hey, I'll pray for you when we don't want to deal with problems that people start to be vulnerable about, but that we would engage in a battle of prayer, that we would engage in activity, that we would encourage, hold each other up, carry each other's burdens, love one another, serve, confront, confess, all the things that we're called to do, and they all require courage. I have courage. Help my uncourage. Help us when we want to run to our comfort zone rather than step into the call of faith. I pray for a man that if in a video game fought Mike Tyson or been in battles of war, but are losing the battle with you, I pray that you'd bring new mercy in this moment. I just wait for tomorrow, right now. Like a soldier gets out of step, get back in line, step by step. Walk in the spirit and you'll have victory. Walk in the flesh and you will be defeated. When you're defeated, cry out to him. There's second chances, third chances, fifth chances, unlimited chances until you have no more breath. So if you feel like a failure, you want to give up, maybe your kids are grown, they don't like you and they don't love Jesus and you think you just, it's over. It's not over, you're still breathing. Maybe just call and apologize today. Just acknowledge the weakness. God shows up and does stuff in that. Some of you are trying, you're doing well. Not perfect, none of us. Keep going, keep going. Help me today to be like a coach at halftime. Come in here and just go, all right, here's we make a couple adjustments, but you're doing great. Be encouraged, filled with courage to keep going. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Well, I've loved being in our Scent series, and if you haven't noticed, but over the last few Sundays, we've actually commissioned and sent people out. If you remember a few weeks ago, Pastor Danny sent all of our missionaries out to go spread the gospel. And then last Sunday, Pastor DJ commissioned a few of our seniors into what's next for them, some gap years, some college years. And as Pastor DJ shared last Sunday is that in our family ministry, we like to celebrate milestones. And that senior commissioning is kind of the end milestone of our family ministry. And today is one of the first milestones of our ministry in, in family ministry. And today we are celebrating our parent commissioning. And so today I wanna to recognize these parents who have, are being sent out and have been sent out to their most important mission field, which is their home. But I wanna take a moment just to kind of walk you through what this parent commissioning process looks like. And it is a process. I think they can all attest to it, that we have walked through this together. And each of these steps of the process was created with the parents in mind because we just feel like in our family ministry that they matter. They matter in their child's spiritual formation and development. And that's exactly the way that God intended it. And so these parents attended uh, about a month ago, our first step. And that's our parent orientation where we laid out to them kind of God's design for them as a parent, where he wants them to be his ambassador to their children. And he wants them to be their lead disciple maker in their home. And then we challenge them to widen their circle. We kind of ask this question is, who do you need to have speaking into your life as a parent? Who's the other voice in the room that you need to have to speak to you and also to speak to your child? You know, if you're a parent, sometimes you tell your kids something and they don't hear it, but somebody else will say the same thing and they'll hear that. You need to have that person in the room. Who's gonna be able to encourage you, challenge you as a parent and walk with you as you parent your child? 
We also shared with them about our family ministry's goal and our vision and how we wanna come alongside them as they make disciples in their home. We wanna be that one of the extra voices in the room echoing what is done and taught in their home. And then a few weeks ago, we had our second step, which is our parent commissioning event. And in that event, um, we marked that day really as a time of commitment where these parents decided with each other, their family, their friends in the room that they're going to be, and they're gonna parent their child intentionally. We talked about application. What are they gonna be those things that you're going to do that's going to help lead your child into a relationship with Jesus? And at the end of the set, that service, we actually did our formal commissioning where we sent them into their mission field. And so church today, I just wanna take an extra moment just to share with you this, the, the third step, which you're a part of today. And the purpose of this is that we're recognizing these families for making this decision and walking through this process and that they're up here publicly declaring to you that they wanna be intentional about leading their child into a relationship with Jesus. And then secondly, man, this is the great part is that we get to be as the church, we get to come alongside them. We get to build partnerships with them. We get to be a part of that disciple making process and we help to encourage them as they're making disciples in their home. So today is a very special day for these Southbridge families. But I wanna recognize them right now. So let me just recognize Charlie and Betsy Joyner and their son, Isaac, Justin and Amy Lindsay and their daughter, Elena, Stephen and Whitley Martinez and their children, Tully and Junella, Matt and Elizabeth McDougal and their son, Elijah, Scott and Amy Sams and their children, Kara, Blake, and Rachel, and Luke and Morgan Weiss and their daughter, Anna, Nick and Catherine Wiley and their children, Quinn and Benjamin. Would you give these families a round of applause? So to conclude our time, thank you guys so much for participating. You've heard enough from me. I'm gonna invite Pastor Scott to come up and he's gonna pray over you guys. Now's where I get to preach another sermon, right? Yeah, you okay, got okay. 15 more minutes. Just kidding. 15, all right, we'll see what we can do. Um, no, obviously you see these families, a great application not only of our series, but we're talking about today. And I know several of you, Dad, specifically, I'll talk to you just because it's Father's Day, not to overlook you, Mom, so you have an important role, too. We talked about that about a month ago. And, uh, but you're being courageous and standing on the stage. You were saying, I'm going to actively be involved. And again, like I said, imperfectly. Um, one of the things that I tell my kids and our staff here at this church is I believe that stories shape culture. And so what are your stories that you're going to share with your kids of you actively actually living out your faith where God showed up? Because the biggest thing you're going to do to show these kids is that God's real. So, you know, you teach them, you know, the things that we believe, salvation by faith alone, the Trinity, the Bible's authoritative. Like, you're going to teach them all these big truths, but uh, demons believe all the right stuff. And uh, they got to see it. And they're going to see it when you guys live it out and trust God to provide and trust God by faith. And so one of the hardest things we see in Scripture is handing our kids over to God. Think about Genesis 22, Abraham and Isaac. And uh, you're dedicating your family to him here. And so you're saying whatever you want to do, whatever you want to do with our family, with our kids. They're yours. We steward them. And uh, you got to do that by faith. So I'm going to pray for you in that. Let's pray. Father, and maybe churches put your hands out on them as well, setting them aside for this task and that we're part of this process with them. So they're saying it's almost like uh, when we have people get baptized and you're celebrating that moment, the new life in Christ, but you're also going to hold people accountable. That, hey, you said you were going to live this new life and sometimes you're not or you're doing a great job. Let's keep encouraging you. And so church, we're, we're saying to these families, we're with you in this. We walk with you in this. You're the primary disciple makers of your kids, but we're here to help. Hold your arms up, love you, carry burdens, pray for you. And so we're praying for you right now. Father, I pray for each one of these families, they would walk with you. A lot of small steps over a long period of time and end with the prize. The great treasure in the field, the bread that satisfies the living water, you. And we know you from the beginning, but the way we know you at the end of the journey 
is different and better. And I pray that these families would keep taking steps in the journey and grow in you. And I pray for each one of these kids. I pray that they would love you. They would never depart from you. That you would protect them like Job prayed for his kids from the enemy. And when the enemy is allowed in and when there is doubt and difficult, I pray you'd bring them back like prodigals, if there's any. And then our church, these homes, would always welcome them with God's love. That these fathers would be God with skin on to them. These mothers would be great shepherds of their hearts. And these kids would love you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And thank you guys so much. You can go ahead and have a seat. Well, if you've been at Southbridge for a while, maybe you've been wondering, how do I get connected here at Southbridge? Well, I happen to have an answer for you today. So today we are um, hosting our third step, which this third step gives you kind of a backstage pass as we tour you around the campus and show you all the different areas of ministry that you can get involved in. And so we would love to be able to share with you all the different things that go on on a Sunday morning and help you get connected to a serving team. This will happen right after this service. You see the Next Steps um, banner in the back there, um, and they will start taking you around, I think, shortly in about 10 minutes or so. But thank you guys so much for being here today. Happy Father's Day to our dads. Make sure you get a meat boat out there with all kinds of good stuff. And uh, thank you for being here, and we'll see you back here next Sunday.